programming is brought to you by Local Video Marketing. In association with CoachChick.com Are you ready to take your game to the next level? Well, listen closely, because I'm going to tell you why drills in hockey coaching are so important. You see, they help players develop essential skills, such as stick handling, passing, shooting, and teamwork. Drills also help players understand their roles and responsibilities on the ice, leading to better decision-making during gameplay. Coaches should use drills that challenge the player's abilities, while well-structured drill help increase self-confidence and team chemistry. For sure, drills are essential to hockey coaching, developing skills, enhancing teamwork, and boosting mental preparedness. So, let's hit the ice and start drilling! comes to attachment free training one of the areas that you're going to attach your bands to are your feet and obviously because you have two feet 
there's a couple of different ways that you can go ahead and attach up your band. So I want to take you through how to go ahead and attach your bands to your feet in a safe manner that's going to keep them in position and also keep your bands from being damaged. First and foremost, we want to talk a little bit about what's going to happen when you attach your band to your feet. So if I take the band and I hook it onto my foot, one of the key things that you want to make sure that you do is that you attach the band onto the arch of your foot. There's a natural concavity in your foot that allows the band to sit into. As a result of that, it's going to go ahead and stay in place more effectively. Secondly, the band will be placed against the outside of your foot in a con consistent area that will be more comfortable. Now understand this, attaching bands to your feet, you're going to be limited in the size of band that you can use to attach to your feet. If you're going to go ahead and try to do deadlifts with extremely big, thick bands, you're going to probably find that this is not as comfortable. What I'm referring to is attaching your bands to your feet using bands that are a little less resistance, but you want to use them to attach to your feet to go ahead and do upper body training or lower body training. That said, let's talk now about how you want to go ahead and keep your bands safe when you attach them on your feet. The key thing is you want to make sure that whatever surface you're standing on is not going to go ahead and compromise or grind or tether the band while you're training. So my suggestion is that make sure that you're standing on a surface that creates minimal friction. Carpeting, a yoga mat, or some other type of mat are the best options. If you're going to go ahead and train on concrete or asphalt, you want to make sure that you go ahead and put some type of carpeting down to create a barrier between the asphalt and the band so that you don't go ahead and challenge or compromise your band. On grass surfaces or turf surfaces, Typically, you're going to be just fine with those surfaces because they're soft and they're not going to go ahead and challenge the band. Now, let's go ahead and let's get into a couple of different ways that you can go ahead and attach your bands onto your feet. First option is to go ahead and take a double length band. So now we have the 41 inch band and we're going to go ahead and use both components of it. So what I mean by that is we're going to go ahead and attach both these bands onto our feet. That said, there's two ways to do it. You can go ahead and do it by hooking on to just a single foot, or you can lay it down, place it into the arch of your feet, and use it to attach into a double foot position, which you're gonna probably use for things like deadlifts or bent over rows. Now, which one should I choose? Well, by attaching it to a single foot, it's gonna create more length of the band to be used. As a result of that, this may be more comfortable to go ahead and go to one foot to do your bent over rows or if you're going to go ahead and do some kind of bent over deadlift type movement. If you go to two feet, obviously the band is now going to be shorter between your foot and your hand. There's going to be more tension and as a result of that, it's going to create more of a resistance with your movement. So that's why you want to go ahead and use a double band in an either a single foot or double foot attachment. The second way to go ahead and attach your band to your feet is to use a single band. So now what we're going to do is lay the band down and we're only going to use a single portion of the band. So the band is not going to be doubled as we go through. Now this is what you're going to use for a lot of your squats, overhead presses, and those types of things. Once again, there are two ways to do it. You can stand on the band with both feet. Once again, make sure the band is in the arch of your foot, or you can go ahead and stand on it with one foot. Why would I want to go to one foot? Again, it's going to create more band that I can use for retraining versus if I'm in using two feet on the band, it's going to shorten the band between my hand and my foot. That's the key resistance that you want to be aware of. The resistance that comes between where I grasp the band with my hand and where the band is on my foot. That's the tension that's going to be used on the band. So make sure that you're aware of that when you do this. Now with a single foot, there's obviously two options. You could go ahead and do it with the band in front, which is sometimes what we'll do to do simply a split squat or a overhead press movement. But you could also go ahead and take that same situation, step through the band, and now 
the single leg attachment or single foot attachment is on the back side. Now, this is what's going to allow you to go ahead and do simple overhead presses, or you may go ahead, we may show you how to do hammer curls. What by placing the band onto the back foot, it's going to increase the band length and allow you a little bit more distance to stretch the band out to go ahead and do different movements. So placing it on the front foot or placing it on the back foot by stepping through are going to be the two ways that you can go ahead and take a single band and attach it to your feet. self-talk is. It's about the thing that I just messed up. It's about the thing that's already done. So we have to help our athletes move forward into the present. And then thinking about what am I going to do next play, which is the future. But there's a reason why athletes are so crappy at that. Number one, Remember I said we're fearful of being judged when we make a mistake? But here's the, here's the double whammy. They're judging themselves for making the mistake. We can, I'm going to say this again. I started it and I didn't finish it. We cannot move to the next point. We cannot shift from the past to the present unless we use an F word. You know how I love efforts. Forgive. If you, the, the person that sent this email, if you want your athlete to move from the mistakes of the last point and start focusing on the next one, we have to be able to forgive ourselves for being imperfect. And sport teaches us the exact opposite. Sport teaches us to be hard on ourselves. How many, you know how many times I hear a parent say to me, oh, you know, my athlete's really hard on himself. And I'm like, well, stop using that as a badge of honor. Like we say it like it's a good thing. It's not. It's not a good thing to be hard on ourselves. Why do athletes need to be hard on themselves? Why do they need to beat themselves up and be full of negative self-talk? They don't need to do that. Sport will do it for them. Sport will beat them up. Parents will say negative things. Coaches will say negative things. Teammates will say negative things. Opponents will say negative things. Parents of the opponents will say negative things. Social media will say negative things. The athlete does not need to do this. If we're going to move from the past to the present, we have to forgive ourselves for being imperfect. Do you know how hard that is? Because we're getting judged by everyone and everything. We're getting judged for our imperfections. So practice the F word, forgive. I don't expect myself to be perfect. And not only that, I forgive myself when I'm not. So all you people out there, you can think whatever the F you want. Because I'm not seeking your approval. Huh. Wouldn't that be freeing? Wouldn't that be freeing?
Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Hockey Nutrition with Kim. I'm Kim Lucard, Hockey Mom RD, and if you have struggled with trying to figure out what to give your skater just before ice time so that they feel energized, this session is going to be for you. Now, something that you want to remember is a pre-skate snack in the 15 minute window is just a top off their tank snack. It's not a meal. It should not be heavy at all. Something very easy for your skater's body to digest. So if your skater has had a meal two to three hours just before ice time, they're probably going to need a little snack before they get on the ice. And in this time frame, this 15 minute window, aim for only carbohydrate rich foods. And these snacks contain 15 grams of carbohydrates and 60 calories. Some examples are seven to eight mini rice cakes, one tablespoon of raisins, a half a cup of applesauce or a go-go squeeze tube. So you could use a snack cup or a go-go squeeze tube, whichever is more convenient for your skater. A fruit leather strip. Uh, I encourage you to buy the organic ones that do not have any artificial dyes in them. Seven to eight animal cookies. Now notice these are animal cookies without the frosting. And one fourth of a large bagel. You can see you can easily divide it into four. So what you could actually do with all these snacks is you could help your team prepare for those quick turnaround games so that you always have hockey strong snacks for your skater and the team as well. Now you can create your skater's pre-skate snack bag and you'll always be prepared. Thank you so much for watching this episode and to learn more about youth ice hockey nutrition, visit www.hockeymomrd.com. I'm Kim Lucard, Hockey Mom RD. Happy skating till next time. Using an AI digital assistant to greet website visitors and answer questions about products or services brings several advantages. Firstly, it provides immediate assistance, enhancing user experience and satisfaction. Visitors receive instant responses, eliminating the frustration of waiting for human support. Secondly, an AI assistant can handle a large volume of inquiries simultaneously, ensuring scalability. It engages with multiple users concurrently, offering consistent support, 24-7, this preventing potential customers from leaving due to unanswered queries. It eliminates human error or inconsistency, improving the website's credibility. Furthermore, an AI assistant collects valuable data and insights. Interactions with visitors yield information on preferences, FAQs, and pain points. This data enhances website design, marketing strategies, and product service offerings. In conclusion, implementing an AI assistant on a website offers immediate assistance, scalability, accurate information, and valuable data collection. This leads to improved user experience, increased satisfaction, and better business outcomes. Before I really start here, let me remind members that there is a really in-depth video available on this site called Troubleshooting Basic Breakouts. It goes pretty deeply into this area of our game, and a member might watch that video for a much broader approach on the subject. With that, let me tell you about the time I wanted to introduce a key part of breakouts to a young white team. 
First, I don't think you can blame young kids for just closing their eyes and throwing the puck up the boards or elsewhere. But you and I know that opposing players are as apt to retrieve that kind of pass as one of our own players. So here's what I thought. I'd have us coaches take turns controlling a certain kind of drill for a few nights. What we'd each do is dump the puck in and then act as opposing forecheckers. Our aim would be to go slowly and rather deliberately without trying to fool a young defenseman who would retrieve our dumper. In fact, because all us coaches wore black, we'd tell the kids to just keep the puck far from the one black guy on the ice. So, a coach would dump the puck and he'd then circle in from one direction in hopes our young D would see him and escape the other way. After a few tries at that, we advised our defenseman to next make a pass to the winger on the escape side. Is it oversimplified? Yep. But did it work? You bet. successful with us I call it arm skating I've also heard referred to as flat skating so the drill looks like this you're gonna have the players in groups and I usually do it in groups of two so we're gonna have Harry and, and uh, Graham go and then we're gonna have Alex and, and Kellen go so the teaching cues are this keep your skates flat push with your skates and move your arms side to side as much as you possibly can as much as you possibly can so then you come down, you take a shot, and then you do the same thing going back. So excuse my back, but just look at my arm movement. So you really want to tell the players, move your arms as much as you can. They take a shot. Another teaching cue or coaching point would be careful of how high your stick comes. So instead of this, you want your players to have their stick pretty close to the ice. The point is, though, you want forceful arm movement with a little bit of leg movement so the muscles in the shoulders and the chest can memorize the movement of the arms moving side to side. We do it three ways. The first time is with two hands in the stick, second time is with one hand in the stick, and the third time is one hand in the stick pushing the puck. So, do you guys understand what to do? Yeah, you're going to go continuously, all right? So move your arms a lot, a lot, a lot. Go for it. That's it. Push, push your arms. Move your arms more, Graham. Push your arms more. Try to go as fast as you can by moving your arms. You got the shot? Now, same thing going back. That's it. Keep your knees bent. That's another good coaching point. Keep your knees bent. Okay, let's go again, guys. Let's show them again how you're doing it. Well, let's stay, stay with two hands. Two hands on your stick. Two hands. So move your arms faster this time. See if you can move your arms faster. Now, I like the way that Harry and Graham are doing it because they're going straight. Sometimes you'll see players when they're zigzagging down the ice, but you can see they're just moving their arms and they're pushing out to the side. So you got two groups going, coaches. So two times around is probably enough. So let's switch now and have Alex and Kellen. Now, these guys, that wasn't a problem. With Alex and Kellen, it's maybe a little bit more of a challenge. So do you guys understand what to do? Two hands on your stick and move your arms as much as you can. Okay, go for it. That's it. Push, push. That's it, Kellen. That's really good, Kellen. And, and Alex, that's nice. I love that. Good. Keep going. Push, push, push. Take a shot. Take a shot. That's it. Good work, you guys. Good work. 
Okay, move your arms side to side. Move your arms side to side. Show me, show me, show me. That's it. Yeah, you got it. Now you got it. That's good. Keep going, keep going. This has been a local video marketing production. We hope you've enjoyed this and that you've picked up a number of great hockey tips. Please do tell some friends about these shows and let the contributing coaches know how much you appreciate them.